come right back now to the story of the nobleman at Capernaum to note the developments in this man's experience and uh, the particular emphasis now is the transition from a faith built upon the testimony of others and now a faith built upon his own contact with Jesus Christ. Now the Holy Spirit of course is the powerful agency by which truth is imparted to a human mind and when the words of Christ were conveyed to this man then the Holy Spirit took those words and carried them to him as words of life and power and to help us to appreciate the life and power which is in the word of God we'll turn to some statements down in the book Ministry of Healing where Sister White tells us how very powerful and mighty the actual words of Jesus Christ are we are to understand that in the word of God is the actual power of God itself I turn to page 122 in the book uh, Ministry of Healing 122 Ministry of Healing and on this page it talks about the mighty power contained in the actual promises of God and the statement says the same power that Christ exercised when he walked vis visibly among men is in his word the same power is in his word we might find this rather difficult to believe because as far as we can tell the words are just simply ink on white paper black ink on white paper but that that black ink on white paper of course is the record of the actual word of God and in that word itself is the actual power of God I read further it was by his word that Jesus healed disease and cast out demons by his word he stilled the sea and raised the dead and the people bore witness that his word was with power he spoke the word of God as he has spoken to all the prophets and teachers of the Old Testament the whole Bible is a manifestation of Christ the scriptures are to be received as God's word to us not written merely but spoken in other words when you read the word of God don't think of this as being merely a written account of the words of God but think of this as being the spoken word of God to you personally I read further when the afflicted ones came to Christ he beheld not only those who asked for help but all who throughout the ages should come to him in like need and with like faith when he said to the paralytic son be of good cheer thy sins be forgiven thee when he said to the woman of Capernaum daughter be of good comfort thy faith hath made thee whole go in peace he spoke to other afflicted sin burdened ones who should seek his help Matthew 9 verse 2 and Luke 8 and verse 48 and now comes the main paragraph the third one reading and this says this, so with all the promises of God's word in them and not just through but in them he is speaking to us individually speaking as directly as if we could listen to his voice it is in these promises that Christ communicates to us his grace and power they are leaves from that tree which is for the healing of the nations received, assimilated they are to be the strength of the character the inspiration and the sustenance of the life nothing else can have such healing power nothing besides can impart the courage and faith which give vital energy to the whole being and that's, note the words again in these promises not just through them but it, it is in these promises that Christ communicates to us his grace and his power they are leaves from that tree which is for the healing of the nations Revelation 22 and verse 2 <clears throat> so that those promises actually contain the power of God and we need to recognize that the promises contained in the Bible are not just mere words but they are expressions of God's power to usward and let's turn back uh, right now to uh, John chapter 4 to read a little further in the story of the man that, who came to Christ with the son who was sick and dying back in his own ho home at uh, Capernaum John the fourth chapter and we come down to verse 48 where Christ spoke the word to that man then said Jesus unto him John 4 and verse 48 except you see signs and wonders you will not believe 
And that was the word of Christ to that man, and in that word was the living power of God. And that man that day, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, saw in that word the living power, thus he made his own experience with Jesus Christ, his own experience of seeing the power of God, and that experience that he went through at that point of time gave to him a much higher level of faith, a level of faith which enabled him now to lay hold upon the power of God and experience the salvation which Jesus Christ desired to give both to him and to his son. And <clears throat> we can't overemphasize the sheer necessity of every individual going to the Bible and finding therein those promises which are filled with the power of God which are especially applicable to your own personal need. So I'll read a little further now from uh, Desire of Ages, page 198, where, we, where, the, where the word reads as follows. Yet the nobleman had a degree of faith, for he came to ask what seemed to him the most precious of all blessings. Jesus had a greater gift to bestow. He desired not only to heal the child, but to make the officer in his household share in the blessings of salvation, and to kindle a light in Capernaum, which was so soon to be the field of his own labours. Mm -hmm. But the nobleman must realise his need before he would desire the grace of Christ. This courtier represented many of his nation. They were interested in Jesus from selfish motives. They hoped to receive some special benefit through his power, and they staked their faith on the granting of this temporal favour, but they were ignorant as to their spiritual disease and saw not their need of divine grace. Like a flash of light, the Saviour's words to the nobleman laid bare his heart. He saw that his motives in seeking Jesus were selfish. His vacillating faith appeared in his true character, or appeared to him in his true character. In deep distress he realised that his doubt might cost the life of his son. Before I go any further, note that the statement says, first of all, that the nobleman had to see his need, had to recognise just what his need really was. And of course, the word of God as spoken by Jesus Christ gave to that man a revelation of that need. And seeing his need, um, he was then led, of course, to reach out and lay hold upon the blessings that Christ had for him. And note this revelation to the man like a flash of light, the Saviour's words to the nobleman laid bare his heart. He saw, he saw, that his motives in seeking Jesus were selfish. His vacillating faith appeared to him in his true character. So the man actually saw those things for himself and seeing those things for himself, fortunately for him, he recognised and acknowledged that what God was showing to him was in fact the truth. Now this is extremely important because all too often we find that uh, when the Spirit of God comes to our person with convicting power, the revelation is not a very welcome one. And this revelation to this man certainly was not a very welcome revelation, to say the least of it. And that man could very easily have said, well now look, I'm a very, um, uh, I'm a Christian, I'm a member of the Jewish uh, organization, I believe in the Bible, and I pay my dues to God and so forth and therefore this is not a true picture of myself. If he'd done that, he would have cut himself off from Christ's ministering spirit. And I have found in my own work that um, again and again I've seen people come to this very point and then when the unwelcome revelation of themselves come, comes to them, they back off and begin to parade all their good works and their good intentions and their good motives. And when they do this, they simply come right back now to the story of the nobleman at appear in this particular verse mm. therefore I say unto you what things will you desire when you pray believe that you receive them and you shall have them and when do we believe we receive them when we pray at that very point of time and if we believe at that point of time that we have received the blessing then what we have in fact received it going back now to desire of ages again we are to receive the blessing by faith, we are thanking that we have received it, 
Then we are to go about our duties assured that the blessing will be realised when we need it most. And in the book Education, page 258, again, we, there's, there are added two or three words which um, make the meaning a little more clear. Um, it says, The gift is in the promise, and we may go about our work assured that what God has promised He is able to perform, and that the gift which we already possess will be realised when we need it most. <clears throat> So then to uh, read the statement in Desire of Ages and Fall with the added words it would sound like this. <clears throat> then we are to go about our duties assured that the blessing which we already possess will be realised when we need it most. When we've learned to do this we shall know that our prayers are answered. God will do for us exceeding abundantly according to the riches of his glory and the working of his mighty power. All right, let's get those facts down now on the, on the board this afternoon so we've got them before our minds. The first point is that we are to know the promises. I just put the word know for short. We are to trust in those promises, which means we absolutely believe them. Right, we are to come to the heavenly high priest and ask for the blessing we are to receive it by faith and therefore actually in fact we are to thank him that we have received it then we are to go about our duties possessing the gift so here we have possession of the gift assured that the blessing will be realized when we need it most so here comes the hour of need and when the hour of need comes, then in turn comes the realisation of that very, very precious gift. Now I must stress the point that during this period between the actual reception of the gift and the realisation of the gift, we possess it during that time only by faith, and that faith is based upon the Word of God. So here then is the gift by faith, which is based upon the Word of God during that period of time. Now that means that during that period of time from the asking and the realisation we do not receive any other visible evidence that the gift is ours but we will find that during this, this period of time there is another witness and that is the witness of feeling and the witness of feeling is based upon sight and circumstances now that witness is against the witness of faith the two of them do not agree with each other. The witness of feeling is against the witness of faith and during that period of time you're going to find that um, that the witness of feeling will Satan will appeal to the witness of feeling and do his level best through that witness to, to destroy your faith in the word of God. But not because you see, not because you feel are you to believe. You are to say, no, I received the gift, I believe it, not because I feel it, but because God has promised. And you're resting your faith altogether and completely in that promise. Now that's hard for us to do, isn't it? That's difficult for a human mind to do that. But Christ did it. For instance, when he was in the Mount of Temptation, the Word of God said back here, You are my beloved Son. But during the next 40 days, every visible witness of sight and circumstances said to him, you are not the Son of God because God would not leave His Son out here in the desert to, to die from starvation. He wouldn't leave Him alone and comforted by other beings such as angels or men. So during those 40 days, every witness of feeling based upon circumstances said to Jesus Christ, You are not the Son of God, but Christ said, I live by every word which proceeds out of God's mouth. I believe in that word and that word says, I am God's Son and despite evidence to the contrary, that is what I believe. Now we should never rest until we learn to rest ourselves in the promises of God in this way. And you will find that when you have learned to do this, you will certainly know that your prayers are answered. They certainly know it. And victories will be gained that you never thought possible. In fact, of course, it's the only way to live by faith in the promises of God. Remember the Bible says in three or four places, the just shall live by faith. And in connection with this, and I'm passing over this part fairly quickly because I know that we've dealt with it previously, and I wanted simply as an introduction to 
what I want to say now beyond that point in regard to the true science of prayer. Let's turn now to Matthew chapter 11, the 11th chapter of Matthew, where Christ made an observation in regard to that prophet and to the results of his ministry in, in a vastly increased uh, activity in prayer life which had developed back in those days. Now Matthew chapter 11 is the story, first of all, of the coming of John's disciples to, to the Saviour to ask him a very important question regarding the, the validity of his mission. Was he the Messiah or was he not the Messiah? That was the question. And John was concerned, of course, that the apostles, his apostles, should gain from Christ some assurance which would strengthen their faith. He wasn't so concerned about himself. And when they came, Jesus advised them to stand by all day long and just listen and watch, which they did. And um, now in verse 7 it says, And as they departed, Jesus began to say to the multitude concerning John, What went you out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with the wind. But what went you out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment. Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what went you out for to see? A prophet. Yea, I say unto you, and more than a prophet, for this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Verily I say unto you, among them which are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John, now I come to the important verses now, verses 12 in, well, verse 12 in particular. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied prophesy unto John, and if you receive it, this is Elias, which was for to come, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Right, then in verse 12 it says, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. Now don't they sound like rather strange words? Because in respect to God's kingdom, we understand that force has no part in God's kingdom. It's not God's way. Now when we use the word force, of course, we think in terms of... Um, people enforcing on others by the power of weapons their will policemen, armies, parents and so forth enforcing their will upon others but there is such a thing as spiritual violence there is such a thing as spiritual force and um, there are of course many forces in the world which are very necessary, very legitimate the force of the wind, the force of the sun the force of electricity and many other things that uh, we could refer to in that particular field or a particular area. So what does it mean when it says that the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force? And why only since the days of John the Baptist? Well, we'll learn, of course, that um, Christ was speaking in the immediate context of people who were then living, and this was not the first time that the kingdom of God was taken by violence. In fact, we'll find that when Jacob wrestled that night upon the uh, lonely, in the lonely desert area near the brook Jabbok, that uh, he most certainly took the kingdom of heaven by violence or by force that particular night. And we are to learn likewise to take it by force if we desire to really see the work of God advance in our own lives, first of all, and in the world in general, in the second sense of the word. And when John the Baptist came, of course, he opened up before the people who were dead in their, in their apostate condition. He opened up before them the possibility of very rich and marvellous treasures, which were an incentive which drove them to reach out and lay hold upon the, the treasures that God had for them. And the spiritual violence which this realisation generated was uh, known since John the Baptist days, um, and it was generated by him by his ministry and preaching. And we'll look at that more, more in detail in the next study period because now our time has virtually gone for this one and we'll have to stop at this point. Yeah. Right, are there any questions you'd like to ask before we uh, have a little break? Very good, the time now is uh, five minutes to four, well, seven minutes to four to be exact. 
Let's take a break till ten minutes past four and then we can proceed again with our next study period.